Hi, everybody. It's an honor for me to address you today. And we are thanking God because he's brought us through this 40 days of my city, God's city. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you've allowed us to study this material. You allowed us to be able to understand it and to be determined to reach our city for Jesus. In his name, we do pray. Amen. If you are a follower of Jesus, there are two questions you must ask yourself every day. The first question is, what breaks your heart? And the second question is, what are you going to do about it? First question has to do with purpose. And the second question has to do with the plan. What is it that breaks your heart when you look at your city, at your particular city, at your particular community, at your particular neighborhood that you live in? What breaks your heart about your neighborhood? I believe evangelism always starts with a broken heart. What is it about your neighborhood that breaks your heart? Is it marriages falling apart? Does it have to do with young people? Is it about addiction? Is it about abandonment? Is it about abuse? What is it about your particular family unit that breaks your heart? What is it about the people who surround you at work every day that breaks your heart? The reason why we sometimes don't reach out is because our heart is not broken. We have become too comfortable in the lives that we live. We have become too focused on getting ahead and getting that next paycheck and making sure there's food on the table. And we are so focused on what we have going on that our heart hasn't broken in a long time. What is it that breaks your heart? And what are you going to do about it? In the Bible, there's a story that's very appropriate for these ending this 40 days. It's one of the premier stories about evangelism and connecting and reaching. That story is found in the book of Luke, chapter 15. I want to read the first part of the introduction to that story, and then I'm going to get three principles out of the story itself, which is the story of the prodigal son. The Bible says the following, verse 1, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Often came to listen. Often. Here, here's two groups of people. Notice, notice everybody. Here's two groups of people. Number one, you have tax collectors. And number two, you have other notorious sinners, right? These two groups are on, on the one side of Jesus. But the Bible says that on the other side of Jesus, uh, verse two, the Pharisees and teachers of religious law. So you have tax collectors and notorious sinners, uh, tax collectors and the weed de dealer, tax collectors, right, and the prostitute, tax collectors and the people that rob people, tax collectors over here on the left, and then you have over here the religious leaders, right, the holy people, the people that have it all together, the people that thumb their noses at everybody else. You have these two groups. One group thought they could not approach Jesus. They said, I don't deserve him. And the other one thought, I don't need him. So he has, he, he's effective at the same time. Listen to me, everybody. He's effective at the same time in reaching the lost and the ones who think they're saved. He is at the same time perfectly holy and perfectly friendly. I think sometimes in the church, we, we, we go to one of the two extremes in our own personal lives, that we want to be so holy that we alienate people. Or we would just want to be just like everybody else, that there's no difference be between us. I mean, we lie the same, and we ch shack up the same, and our sexual, uh, you know, the porn watching is the same, and divorce rate is the same. So there's no, and our line is the same, right? So so here's these, these two groups of people that come to come to, to, to listen to Jesus, and Jesus tells them three stories. He tells them a story about a lost coin and a lost sheep and a lost son. And from that story of the lost son, I'm going to bring out three principles, and we're going to enjoy ourselves together in this message. 
These are three principles about evangelism, reaching your city, my city, God's city, three things. Number one, what brought the prodigal home was need, not theology. There are very few people in your town in New Jersey. There are very few people. Maybe some, some other people are watching this somewhere else in, in California or Texas. I, I don't know where you're watching this, but I just want to let you know. There are very few people in your community who are sitting home thinking to themselves, I wish somebody would come around and have a, and have a religious argument with me. I wish somebody would come around and engage me in a religious fight. I wish somebody would come around and tell me how wrong I am about the way I understand the Bible and how satanic my Virgin Mary is. I wish somebody would come around and tell me everything I know is wrong. There are very few people like that. What brings people home is need. That's the first step. I'm not discounting theology because the study of God's word is essential to our spiritual growth. But it's not the first step. Ellen White says very famously that if you want to reach people, you first have to gain their confidence and you got to meet their needs, right? And you have to show yourself friendly and then you can bid him them to follow Jesus. But we, we sometimes go about it the wrong way. We first want to make them Adventists and then, then we want to make them Christians and then maybe we'll make them our friends. What brought the prodigal home was need, not theology. You can see this text, verse 14 in chapter 15 of Luke. He said, after he has spent everything, so he had financial need, there was a severe famine, right? So he had food need, and, and he began to be in need. And he came to his senses, and he said, how many of my father's higher servants had food to spare? And here I am starving, right? Hunger as another need. I will set out and go back to my father. This connection. That's another need, right? Fam lack of family relationships. That's another need. Strange places. Disconnection. That's another need. What brought the prodigal home was need, not theology. So if you want to be effective in your community, the first question is not what can we teach them, but what do they need? And the way to find out what they need It's not for us to get in a holy huddle and think, okay, what do you think the community needs? How about you, John? How about you, Francis? How about you, Roger? How about you? What, what, what do you think, Timothy? What do you think, Sister Mary? What do you think? What, okay, I think we are too. And I think we're, and we come up with all these wonderful ideas and we have never asked the community that we lived in what the real needs are what do have you gone into your community have you asked the people in your community what is it that you want if your church were to disappear tomorrow from your community would the community miss it a better question would your members miss it like if there was no more church tomorrow would your members miss it would your community miss it right I, I, I want to read a quote from Ellen White from Mount of Blessings, chapter 136, says, A religion that leads men to place a low estimate upon human beings, whom Christ has esteemed of such value as to give himself for them, a religion that would lead us to be careless, and then she mentions three things, careless of human needs, sufferings, and rights. It's a spurious religion. I don't know what spurious means, but it's probably not good. I remember my mom saying, I want to serve you some spurious rice, right? And some spurious rice and beans. Spurious religion. What is a spurious religion? It's one that is careless of human needs, sufferings, or rights. In sliding the claims of the poor, the suffering, and the sinful, we are proving ourselves traitors to Christ. It is because men will take upon themselves the name of Christ while in life they deny his character that Christianity has so little power in the world. We've aligned ourselves. I'm not saying your church. I'm saying the perception of American 
population is that Christians are aligned with one specific political party and they're aligned with power in Washington versus the power and the throne that we believe that our savior lives in the White House instead of in heaven. That we think that the solutions for this world are just what we can do, but we have a power that's greater than anybody. And when we have that power with us, the first thing that we're going to do as a church is to look around us and find out who has needs, who is suffering, who is getting their rights violated. Let's address those issues. When a church is not address the needs, sufferings, and rights of people, it mutes itself. Here, here we see the prodigal son coming home, not because he has understood the deep theology of the 2300-day prophecy. It's a great prophecy to understand. But what do I do with people who can understand prophecy intellectually but cannot have a date with their spouse weekly? What do I do with people that can understand biblical concept but do not understand the concept of being present with their children? What do I do with people who can tell you? I mean, they, 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 they will not only die for the truth, they will kill for it because it's just about a dogma. It's about a belief system. It's about just all it matters is that we teach him some things about the Bible. Now, I love the Bible. It transformed my life. It changed me from the inside out. But you know what? If you give somebody who is hungry a Bible, it's not going to fill their tummy. So we first have to feed them so they can listen to what we have to say about Scripture. So people tell me, okay, Pastor, all right, so, you know, we're, we're, we're serving food at the church and we're, we're engaged with our community. When do we tell them about Jesus? Okay, what? Is it a month into it? Is it two months? If there, is it after 40 days? What? When, when do we tell them about Jesus? Here's my answer to that, everybody. Here's my answer to that. You tell them about Jesus. This is the way you do it. You serve them until they ask why. You serve them until they ask why. And then when they ask why, you tell them about the truth that is in you. You tell them about the great gospel story. You tell them about a God that transformed, that cares about us so much that he came into our neighborhood. He lived in our hood, right? He didn't just look at us from heaven and say, man, those poor people, they're making the worst choices in the world. I don't know if I should even go down there because some of them might reject me. He came into our neighborhood. He was born in a manger. He had a humble life and he became one of us because he wants us to un under understand that church is more effective when it, it is incarnational. Three things about the prodigal son. The first one, what brought him home was need, not theology. The first thing we have to do is make sure that people understand that we care about what is happening in their life. In every single community, there are five needs. I call them the five H's. In, fa in fact, I, I would add a, a six H, and I'll get to that in a moment. The first one is hunger. In your community, there's hunger. And second H is homelessness. In your community, there's homelessness. The third H is human trafficking. In your community, there's human trafficking. The fourth H is health. In your community, there's health issues. And the fourth one is help. In your community, there's somebody that needs help. And the sixth H is history. In your community, there's racial history. There's a racial underpinning about what's happening with the inequality in your community. There's a history that we we can't just say, well, hey, there's no nobody's a slave right now, so everything is back. So racism is over. Racism is over. That's the greatest lie I've ever heard. See, it, it's it's impossible to be enslaved for 400 years to understand the, the damage that does 
to a community. And then just think one day you snap your fingers because you have a black president. Now racism is over. Let me tell you, there are, there's a history. It's a racial history. So as Christians, we have to address, okay, where are people hungry that we can feed them? Where are people homeless that we can give them lodging? Where, where are people being trafficked, uh, right? Immigrant population, high human traffic in index. There's a lot of you who have never met a human trafficking victim. Just because you've never met one doesn't mean they don't exist. There are people in your community working with human trafficking victims. Where can we help them? Where, where's the health issues in our community that I can help them with? What help do they need that I can provide? And what history do we need to undo and write a new story going forward? What brought the, 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 the son home was not was not theology, it was need. Number two, the second principle about evangelism, celebrating the end of this 40 days is this, killing sacred cows and reaching lost people go hand in hand. Verse 23, the Bible says this, and kill the calf we have been fattening, we must celebrate with a feast. This is what they did, they killed the cow. You can keep your cow or you can reach you can keep, you can have your son, but you can't have both. And every church has sacred cows, right? Sacred cows is this. This is how we do things here, pastor. When a pastor comes in, there's somebody, nobody assigned them to that, but there's somebody always who goes up to the new pastor and tell him, hey, in this church, we march from the back. In this church, we wear white gloves for communion. In this church, we always sing hymn number 53 in the beginning of the worship. In this church, we always recite. In this church, we always, we never, we always, we never, we must. In this church, you can't move that picture right there that's full of dust because somebody donated that in 1953. In this church, in this church, nobody under 50 can be an elder. <laughs> There's nothing written in, in the manual about that. That's just how we do things here. That is the culture of our church. This is what we do. And unless you change the culture and make it healthier, every single thing that the, 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 the healthy thing that, that touches the culture is going to get infected. You have to understand that there's going to be some sacred cows. You have to ask yourself, is everything, is what we do? Here's, here's, the, here, here's the, 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 the question that I want you to ask yourself is what we do and how we do it. This is a foundational question. Is what we do and how we do it the best way to reach lost people? So you have to filter every single thing you do, church, through that. Is what we do and how we do it the best way to reach lost people? Let's take worship in the morning, on Sabbath morning. Is what we do and how we do it the best way to reach lost people? Right? Or is it just we sing songs that we like with the instruments that we like, with the way of operating church that we like, with the structure and the length of service that we like? So it's about us, right? It's about us, what we like. It's Fubu Church for us, by us. And then we ask ourselves, why isn't why isn't the community coming? Oh, it's because it's because the Holy Spirit is being removed from the earth. It's because people don't want anything to do with God. No, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that, but but maybe it's you, bro. Maybe it's that you've insisted in elevating to the level of principles things that are just personal preferences. So I have to ask myself, okay, if I have a Pathfinder club and there are no community kids, I'm doing it wrong. If I have an adventurer club and there are no community kids, I'm doing it wrong. If I have a ladies' day and there are no ladies from the community, I'm doing it wrong. If I have a men's breakfast and there are no men from the community, I'm doing it wrong. Whatever it is that I do. I have to ask myself, I have to filter everything I do. Is what we're doing and how we're doing it the best way to reach lost people? And you have to take a knife, you know, you have to get, get your pastor a set of Costco knives and say, hey, sacred cows make great hamburgers. I know some of y'all are getting crazy because we don't eat meat. I'm not saying that you should eat meat. You can make it a veggie burger if you want, but somebody got to kill those sacred cows. These are the things we've been doing forever that have no relevance in 2021, and we're still doing it just because we've always done them. We call those the just because programs. The just because. So why do you do it? I don't know. Just because. So what? 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 Why can't we change it? No, we can't. Why not? Because that's this just just we just do it this way. This is how we do it. 
This is the culture of our church. And I'm saying, what's more important, your personal preferences or the lost people in your community? What's more important, reaching your community for Jesus or are you maintaining, right? We, we kept our hymnals and we, and we lost our kids. And that's tragic and it's unacceptable and it's unholy and it's sinful because you've made the specific order of worship an idol. We can't change the order of worship because you know how an idol, how you can tell an idol, change something about it. Tell people you're going to change it. See how they react. We've made order of worships idols. The problem with idols is that they always demand the sacrifice of our children. And I'm just speaking truth to somebody. I don't know you. You're watching me. I don't know where you're watching this from. But I'm telling you, there are some sacred cows in your congregation that you must address. You must have the fortitude and the courage to say, there's no rhyme or reason why we're doing it except for that's the way we've always done them. And I need to, we need to look together at a way forward that is based more on imagination and not memory. And number three, brace for this one because some of you are going to get upset at me, but that's fine. I love you in Jesus' name. Hugs, 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 right? Hugs. The third thing, if you want to be successful, in my city, God's city, you have to align your anger with God's. Be angry at the same thing God is angry about. And don't be angry at the stuff he's not angry about, right? There's a lot of misguided angry. There's a lot of misguided anger in Christian circles today. Anger. Just really lots of anger about things that God is not angry about. God is not angry about whether you use drums or not. He's not. He's just not. Whether somebody ate tofu or a chicken leg. Nobody's, God is not angry about the fact that you ate cheese. God is not angry about the fact that you did not wear a tie to church. He's not angry. He's not tripping about that. He, God is not upset in the, in the heaven saying, man, that, that guy didn't wear a suit today. I am so mad right now. You know what God is angry at? Let me tell you what he's angry at. Okay? Let me tell you what he's angry at. It's interesting that in verse 28, the older the Bible says that the older brother was angry. At the younger brother and we're not going. Why is he angry? Because he thinks it's unfair. And there's some people are like, yeah, when I was growing up in the church, they were really strict and it was really hard for me. And they, today they just want people just this young, this young kids, this young, young whippersnappers. They just want to do whatever they want. No, 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 no. I'm not saying I'm not saying to be a permissive church, right? I, I'm I'm saying the, to be a purposeful church, right? And you have to you have to align your anger. With what God is anger, angry at. What is God angry at? So you have to ask yourself, okay, why is, why is he mad at? Proverbs 6.16 6, says, there are six things the Lord hates. Okay, all right, good start. These are the things that he hates. So he's probably mad at those. Seven that are detestable to him. So he adds another one. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. I've seen that in church too, you know. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. What is God at? Mad at? He's, not a, he's not mad about a Christmas tree. He's not mad about the fact you play drums in church. He's not mad about the fact that you did not eat tofu. He's mad about the shedding of innocent blood. He's mad about people getting shot in the back in your community. He's mad about the fact there are people in government that lie. He's mad about the fact that people are being racially profiled. They are being oppressed. He's mad. You look in the Bible from beginning to end, and you take all the social justice elements out of Scripture, and you will not, you, you will not end up with a Bible. You end up with a book. That's it. God is really upset when one group of people is taking advantage of another. If you really want to make God mad, oppress somebody because he gave to give us freedom. The, 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 the government of the evil one is based on fear and control. And the government of God is based on freedom, liberty, love. So you have to ask yourself, whenever we see in our communities people that are being oppressed, lying tongues, people that are quick to, to rush into evil,
false witness. We must align our anger with what God is angry about. I just wanted to, to have the opportunity to tell you this today because there's people upset about a, about Hollywood being Hollywood. Why, why are you so upset posting on social media about the evils of Hollywood and retweeting stuff about the evils of Hollywood? What do you think Hollywood is? Hollywood's not a church. No, it's about this song. And, the, you know, did you see Beyonce, what she was doing? Beyonce's going to do Beyonce things, right? People who are, <laughs> people who, who are, who are in that world are going to do what they do in that world. So instead of worrying so much about cursing darkness, light up a light. Shine a light in your community. Speak out about what's happening in your community, how your community is being oppressed, is being destroyed, is being systematically discriminated. How can we do it? Feeding the community is amazing. But elevating the community so they can feed themselves is even more amazing. I'm not just wanting to just hand out loaves and fishes. I want to be able for people to grow their own wheat so they can make their own bread in their own land. I want people to have their own fish factories and own a lake they can fish from with a house next to it. That's what I'm into. I'm not just into feeding people and being ha having them come to the church all the time with the same because of systemic oppression and systemic discrimination and mass incarceration. We keep people in the cycle. At some point, the gospel has to explain to us. And we need to be proclaimers in our community that there is a better way. When Christ comes to our life, he not only changes our perspective, he changes our purpose. And in Jesus' name, we can do this together. So I'm going to pray for you. I know some of these parts of this message, some of you are recording. Some of you are not really sure whether this can happen or not. I'm just saying, read the parable again. Read that text again. And ask God in 2021, ask God that this year will be a year that you're poised for your city. That is God's city to be your city and God's purpose to be implemented in your city. Heavenly Father, I pray every single person that's watching this, that their heart be, might be stirred, so their idols might be torn down. So their sacred cows might be laid at the altar and that you will allow a fresh purpose and anointing and direction to rise up from the ashes of the pandemic with new purpose, with new direction, with new intentionality. I ask these things because you hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. May God bless you. It's been a privilege being with you. I have a YouTube channel if you want to check it out. There's a lot of messages like that. It was great talking to you today. Just go subscribe to my channel. Send me a message if you heard this. Ask me questions if you have them, and I hope to see you soon together in the kingdom of heaven when Jesus Christ comes back to take us home forever.